Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Book Rising podcast and also a special video conversation for Brittle Paper. Uh, thank you so much, Margot Jefferson and Victoria adukwai Bulle, for joining me today. Uh, both of you have just won the Rathbones Folio Prize. So huge congratulations to the both of you. That's very exciting. And we'll talk a little bit about that. <laughs> and um, for those who haven't read your works, I wanted to have you both in here and talk a little bit about your books, a little bit about this unique prize and the type of, uh, you know, the, the type of sort of genre bending work that both of you are producing. Um, and I will uh, just say a little bit about the both of you and then hopefully you can give me a tiny excerpt uh, of your work so the readers who haven't read it yet are inspired and uh, will jump out and go and buy your books. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, Margot. So Margot Jefferson is a truly accomplished writer. She was a theater and book critic for Newsweek and the New York Times, and her writing has appeared in several publications, including Vogue, New York Magazine, and New Republic. She is currently professor of writing at Columbia University, uh, at the School of Arts. Her book, Negro Land, was shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize and was winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's also the author of On Michael Jackson. And most recently, of course, Margot was awarded the Radbones Folio Prize for her work of nonfiction titled Constructing a Nervous System. Um, Victoria Adukwebule is a poet, writer, filmmaker of Ghanaian heritage, born and raised in Essex uh, in England. She was shortlisted for the Brunel University African Poetry Prize in 2016 and received an award for her pamphlet, Girl B, which was published as part of the New Generation African Poets series in 2017. She is an alumna of both the Barbican Young Poets and the Octavia Poetry Collectives and has held residencies internationally in lots of places. Uh, in 2019, she was awarded a Techne scholarship for a fully funded doctoral research at Royal Holloway in London, uh, which so I assume you're, you're working on that right now. And Quiet is her 2022 debut collection of poetry, which also uh, was awarded the Radbuns Folio Prize. So congratulations to the both of you. Welcome, Victoria and Margot. Super excited to talk to you today. And I wanted our audience to get a little taste of your prize winning works. Uh, Margot, would you like to start us off with a short excerpt from your I, book? I will. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. You can hear me clearly. Yes. All right, wonderful. Ah. I stood in a bright, harsh light. The stage was bare. I extended my arm. No, flung, hurled it out, pointed an accusatory finger, then turned to an unseen audience and declared, this is the woman with only one childhood. It was part of my night's dream work, and I was rattled when I woke up, for I'd been addressing myself. My tone was harsh, and my outstretched arm with its accusing finger had the force of that moment in melodrama when the villain, hitherto successful in his schemes to ruin the heroine, is revealed, condemned and readied for punishment. I understood what I had to do. At the end of his stage show, Bill Bojangles Robinson would look up at the lighting booth and shout, give me a light, my color pause, then blackout. When the light returned, I knew it was time to construct another nervous system. For most of my adult life, I'd felt that to become a person of complex and stirring character, a person, as I put it, of inner consequence, I must break myself into pieces, hammer, saw, chisel away at the unworthy parts, then rebuild. It was laborious like stone masonry. And on the stone masonry model, the human self says, go on, admires itself for saying, go on, and proceeds to go on. As I went on, I grew dissatisfied. This edifice was too fixed. 
I wanted it to become an apparatus of mobile parts, parts that fuse, burst, fracture, cluster, hurdle, and drift. I wanted to hear its continuous thrum, thrum go the materials of my life, chosen, imposed, inherited, made up. I imagined it as a nervous system, but not the standard biological one. It was an assemblage. My nervous system is my structure of recombinant thoughts, memories, feelings, sensations, and words. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> That's you. absolutely gorgeous, thank you. Uh, Victoria, you wanna read us something? Of course, um, I'll start with the first poem from um, the book, Quiet. <clears throat> this poem is called Declaration. Declaration. If sickness begins in the gut, if I live in the belly of the beast, if here at the heart of empire, if careful in the house of the host, if quiet at the heart of the host, if here at the home of empire, if I live in the belly of the beast. Let me forget sickness in its gut. Girl. Hair coming down past your breasts like confetti, your straighter teeth, your stripped upper lip recoiling still, your clean, dark complexion. Lean legs or the gap between them, the grasp of your legs at you like a lover, like, like a lover that you'd like to leave, exposing the gap. The sign between your feet pointing upwards, tear here, sun, sea, sand, show butter, you are smoother skin, polished nails, dark eyes, seeing almonds, your voice, your vocal cords, stroked by second-hand smoke, your dozy tongue, stacking it over words you really should know how to pronounce by now. And feet, lithe, slim, no peeling, arches secure as scaffolds, oiled joints, humming the silence of youth, limbs, fighting baby jihads against lipids, still winning. Your heart still kicking it in time. Red metronome, your shunning of the night, a propensity for wakefulness, for pen against paper, a dance of sorts. Because what is death to you? Break, my sweet girl, break. Will you write to me years from today when you no longer are what you are now? I'd like to know what you'll be. Break. Call me when you find out. Break. I'll be here. Gosh, thank you so much. Both uh, really beautiful works, and I've had the privilege to read some of these, uh, you know, both your books uh, before I met you. And I think there's quite a bit in common, in a sense. Uh, a lot of themes that you tackle that are somewhat similar. Uh, Victoria, your collection, Quiet, and Margot, uh, your poetic nonfiction, Constructing a Nervous System, uh, are both deeply invested in experimenting with the uh, sort of narrative techniques, uh, the constantly shifting geography of the eye, uh, innovative aesthetic approaches. Um, and both works are at the same time very political, very daring. They evoke empire, race, gender. Um, and, you know, I just wonder to start us off, how do you both work to fuse the political and the aesthetic? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Shall I? I gesture to the poet. I gesture to the poet. Oh no, <laughs> I was gesturing to you. Um, 
<laughs> um, I, uh, and I just need to begin by saying that it's just an honor to be paired in this session with Margot Jefferson because I am such a fan. I'm such oh. a fan. Um, so you. Well, you, have a, you have a new fan in me. So I've been <laughs> reading you the last few days with such excitement. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess in answer to the question, um, I don't think it's that difficult to uh, to bring the um, did you use the word political? Please can you yes, the question political. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, into the aesthetic. I I don't think it's that difficult because I personally, when I'm writing poems, poems for me are kind of note taking. So. Mm -hmm the way that I think about history or the way that I think about current affairs, um, it kind of forms poetry in my head because I'm trying to get to the heart of the matter at all times. And in order to do that, I have to strip away all of the language that's like stuffing and try and come to some kind of clarity. And I find that poems for me are um, the leftovers of, not the leftovers, but is, are the result of that process if that makes sense so i don't really see a distinction between say reading an academic text reading a non-fiction text and and poetry because for me poetry is just where it goes um it's just a place where i think and so for me anything can influence that thinking whether it's other creative works or whether it's actual uh real life events yeah, yeah, I completely understand that it is a, it's a false division, uh, but one that writers often have to uh, contend with. Uh, you know, if they if they are too political, then their craft is called into uh, question. Uh, but yes, Margot, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> um, the assumption being that um, often that you know, as soon as you say craft, <clears throat> narrative strategies, um, you know, aesthetic techniques. The assumption is this is so complicated, this is profound. Um, we say race, gender, politics, colonialism, um, and suddenly it just becomes this big, these they come, they become these big, vast chunks of um of profound but generic meaning. The fact is, um, there are so many ways um, of growing up, of being um, a colonial subject um, or a colonial object, uh, of being a black, a person of color, of being a woman, um, of in engaging um, with gender and sexuality. There are as many ways of being that, meaning writing it, um, you know, as there are strategies, narrative techniques, poetic devices, um, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all there. We have to, in a sense, live up to excavate that complexity um, and yeah. rather than just leaving it kind of flat in this kind of, you know, it's a little bit political discourse can often feel like very generic um, fiction or um, <laughs> like every word is a cliche, you know, everything. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, or sentimental poetry or, um, you know, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are as many disgraceful types in art as there are in politics. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's what's interesting, which is I was, uh, uh, you know, the Folio Prize is a very recent uh, prize. And one of the re reasons it came about, it was to sort of move away, move readers away from the popular upmarket fiction, uh, you know, usually novels, easy reading, a little bit entertaining, uh, that turn in quickly into films and TV series and so on. Uh, and these are the ones that tend to get rewarded um, uh, in the mainstream. So I think both of you as writers who are rigorous about form and style and politics and keeping all of that together. Uh, are you relieved about such a prize existing? Have you found that editors and publishers have resisted your work? I know there's a bit of a generational difference between the both of you, but I just um, I just uh, wonder whether you've faced some hurdles along the way. Well, you know, um, I have... I, 
Can you hear me? I'm, I'm hearing yes. a weird echo. Okay. Um, you know, I have this double, triple life as, um, you know, a, a critic, journalist mm -hmm. who writes for a range of publications um, and you know, a book writer. Um, and I turned to books for my own, you know, personal desires and, and ambitions, but also because I knew I could do things there. I could try things mm -hmm. as a writer, as a, as a thinker, as a, you know, that I wasn't necessarily going to be able um, to try elsewhere. You know perfectly well, if you're um, writing for any kind of publication, what its limitations or conventions are, whether it's radical or more convert conservative, it's got its conventions. And you pick the ones whose, whose principles and convictions and style most suit you but there are always things missing. Um, so, you know, I basically bifurcated um, my more, a lot of the things that are in this book and in um, even in Negro land um, would be harder to, to publish except in small literary um, magazines. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. I, I think it's e probably, you know, more, more tricky, more difficult for poetry. Yeah, you always remained cognizant of what fits where, in a sense. I think well, you do, um, and, and trying at the same time to keep, you know, the particularities of your voice, your attitude, whatever. But, you know, it's you're always adapting registers, mm -hmm. which you don't have to do, but I didn't have to do in these books. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, I'm really happy that such a prize exists because I think as a poet, you go out into the street and if you ask someone if they read any poetry you don't necessarily expect them to say that they do um and funnily enough when i was coming to the award on monday i guess it was just a week ago i i got a taxi there and in all my years of catching taxis this was the first time i ever had a driver that was a fan of poetry the first time <laughs> I, that was kind of a really nice omen for me but exactly but exactly yeah to answer the question, I I really do value such a prize because um, not just for elevating poetry in some way and placing it on an e on an equal level um, with fiction and nonfiction, but I I am such a fan of fiction and nonfiction of novels and essays and other forms, and for me to have a panel of judges that works in those forms respect something that I've written as a poet is it, it's really really emboldening for me because it says to me that perhaps you know in the future should I want to step outside of my thing which right now is poetry mm -hmm. that I've been seen by people who are doing that and they they have a belief <laughs> perhaps that I could do that as well so you know, even so, you know, perhaps that's a selfish reason for wanting a prize like this to exist. But it, it's, it's a kind of, um, it's an honor that I just can't, uh, can't give words to. I'm so honored. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's funny. Um, I feel exactly the same way as a nonfiction writer. You know, who spent so many years in in journalism. My God, here I am with <laughs> poets you know, and with yeah. fiction writers. That to me felt miraculous and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's funny about your taxi driver, uh, Victoria. I wonder uh, what sort of poetry he did he did read. You know, I mean, as someone who teaches. Uh, literature, uh, I get either the sort of the worst, the worst versions of sort of what we think of as poetry. And I, I, not, I have nothing against the man, but people constantly quoting lines from Robert Frost, you know, um, or, <laughs> or miles to go before I sleep. Two so worlds diverge <laughs> in, in that damn exactly. yellow wood. <laughs> yeah. And Good for him. But, uh, or I have, uh, you know, students as well as adults who love to read novels and even nonfiction, uh, terrified that they, they, they have decided that they will not understand poetry. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's a fear almost. 
Um, so, you know, so I just wondered when you both write, uh, you know, I, I use the word before genre bending uh, and also this kind of, there's a sort of experimentation with the self, uh, you know, almost speculative trajectories uh, when I read your, when you uh, read both your works. So, you know, these are stunning and gorgeous, but I think they're difficult. So I was wondering how you're looking to challenge your readers. Who do you have in mind? Who are you writing to in a way? Hmm. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't think too much about the reader. Um, yeah. Because I worry that if I think about the reader, mm -hmm. um, it could become a very fickle situation in which what's in now is is what I'm aspiring to. But I, I don't think that's a sustainable way to, to have a writing practice mm. to think about the reader because the reader, who is the reader? You know, it's just such a big word, the reader. Um, but I, when I'm writing, I'm really trying to have clarity within myself about something. And I trust that any reader that comes along will be able to follow me. I'm not trying to confound the reader, but I am trying to have them accompany me somewhere. And I am trying to sometimes say, trust me, like you, you will get this, just trust me, just give me a bit more time or think of it this way or, 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 or luxuriate in the sound of things. I think I, I think as much about meaning as I do about sound. And when it comes to words and language and, and sometimes I just want the reader to enjoy how a word sounds with me. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I don't think too much about the reader, but I, and I think that is a service to the reader as well, because I don't think the reader wants someone to be thinking, oh, what do they want? What should I do? I bet she thinks this is good. I, I, I don't think the reader yeah. wants that from me. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Some, sometimes writers and poets are fighting with some, something. Uh, so I guess I was wondering about that. But uh, also you forgot to mention, Victoria, that your poems are so visual, that there is this mm -hmm. uh, extremely gorgeous kind of visual arrangements that go along. Uh, so yes, sound, uh, visual, and then there was a third thing, which now I've forgotten. Clarity, maybe you said. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But those are those ways that you lure you know, readers can be, yeah. they can be lured, they can be really for, you know, X number of pages, then suddenly they're kind of menaced, you know, mm. <laughs> and yeah. they feel, oh, this is a little dangerous, but oh, I'm still having a good time. You know, you can, you can, you can play with a lot of moods. I find mm -hmm. um, thinking a lot about the reader, which again, when you do a lot of journalism, editors often ask you to, um, it can really encourage it really can encourage forms of self-censorship you know mm. you and i that's the you know i I've, I've learned painful lessons that way also um you know i'm i am a black woman um writing in in a world that has black women black men black trans black non-binary many other you know we used to just say in america black and white there are all sorts of other groups and peoples and identities. So if I'm really being doing justice to the complexity and the variety of one's readers or one's potential readers or one's actual readers, you know, no, I, I have to find a generosity and a, and a yeah. scope within myself. That um, that allows for that complexity. I can't second guess. Mm -hmm. um, with a with this book and with constructing, um, I I I was very aware of how shifts of mood as well as of strategy and technique um, can, even when they disrupt a reader, um, excite. Uh, and I mm. I thought I'm not as I think um, Victoria said I'm not trying to trick you, but I am trying to take you to spaces that maybe you hadn't thought of before. I also am trying to encourage you to let your mind um, and heart mm -hmm. <laughs> and language free yeah. in those ways. Call and response in a sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, of mm -hmm. course, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's true. And I, I take particularly like the point about self-censorship when you kind of censor yourself within a certain, uh, you know, group of people that you're 
uh, you're talking to. Uh, right. But yeah, and you that, know. Uh, that can even ahead. be people you admire and, and yeah. you consider your constituents. That can intimidate yeah. Yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, I think uh, we have seen in the past decade or so more than the usual amount of sort of uh, uh, noise or uproar or scandals even about publishing and diversity uh, in the US and the, and the UK. Um, and I just wonder if you feel there are very particular challenges uh, for black women writers uh, in the publishing world. I know a lot is changing, but a lot remains the same. Uh, where, how do you, how would you weigh in on this? Well, I would say two big challenges um, are being made into a, a useful commodity. As soon as you're noted, you become commodified. Um, and then that sets mm. up what's not allowed, what's not chic, what's not fashionable, what um, you know, say larger white audiences might find interesting about black females. Mm -hmm. Oh, but no, I don't find that interesting. So, and then that starts imposing um, genres and voices mm -hmm. um, on writers. So it's it's that 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 sense of um, you're here in a certain way on sufferance, and the sufferance has mm -hmm. to do with what excites and pleases us. A kind yeah. of you know, the old phrase typecasting, if you will. Um, the yeah. types can change or vary, but not completely. But, and if they, even if they change, if the plot remains the same culturally, you're stuck. So I would say that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think that's such a, such a, a brilliant point because I, I, now that I have a book that's in the world, it's, it's 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 kind of creating a different mindset when it comes to thinking about what I'm going to write next, because when you're writing and nobody knows who you are, it's there's a kind of freedom with that. But now that there's a book out in the world, you know, even people, you know, like Margaret said, even people who you aspire to, um, you know, impressing, you know, people, judges or other, you know, people who are um, fellow writers who are further along that journey than you and you know, once they're on your side, you, you still feel like you don't want to disappoint anyone. You want to, you can't help but want your work to be loved. But at the same time, I think with a, a level of attention that's growing, mm -hmm. there is a self-awareness that I'm now thinking, right, how am I going to navigate that to still say what I want to say um, and not the next thing that, someone wants me to say um yeah to be really clear about what my priorities are and what I really mean and um I think one of the things that gets said about uh sometimes about my work um in the context of this book quiet you know I don't want it to be under read as oh, telling people to be quiet or telling people to take time and have self-care I'm thinking communally as well. I'm not just thinking about you know, the individual and resting and this and that. But there are ways that to market your work. Sometimes you end up feeling that you know you, you have to kind of simplify it in a certain way and maybe flatten it a bit. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I think there are challenges with being typecast and also being a commodity, as Margot mentioned. As a black woman, I think you, we encounter so much of oh, black women are going to save us, and it's just like. Mm -hmm something no. is being placed upon you <laughs> yes to be a spokesperson right. when actually I, you just want to write your book. <laughs> you write your book and yes and you want as many styles and modes of so-called personhood um mm. as as the world and your own imagination allow yeah yeah i mean i imagine it's a there's a burden of course uh in in that expectation uh, but I'm sure there's also a kind of um, a impetus or imperative um, to help, you know, other mm -hmm. younger writers succeed, other black women succeed and navigate publishing and so on. Do you sort of feel, uh, you know, with your success, as you become more successful, the drive to kind of towards mentorship or, um, you know, is that still needed, you know, or is is publishing, uh, you know, opening up more? 
I just wonder. Even, even yes. if in spaces yes. it's opening up more, which it is, of course, mentorship is absolutely yeah. um, still needed. These are still spaces that um, Black women were not encouraged, yes. trained, you know, whatever, to navigate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm a second generation feminist. And, you know, my generation, many of us were the first people at these mm -hmm. publishing companies, at these magazines. We had no yeah. clue if we hadn't had mm -hmm. of how to, you know, politically, culturally navigate. If we hadn't had mentors and if we hadn't also mm -hmm. mentored, learned how we might mentor just by honest discussion um, and critique each mm -hmm. other, it would have been hopeless. It's, yeah, my sense is it's very much still needed. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I do agree. Um, um, you know, I'm I'm a fan of so many women from that generation. You know, one mm -hmm. of my books that I return to often to just really get to the sense of what's important. It's just been republished here. Is um, Black Women Writers at Work? It's just this collection mm -hmm. of yes! interviews and interviews. Yes. And um, and I think what I take from that book is not just the sense of right. Let's have a community of writers who aspire to be published but just I, I would like it to be possible for us to write for a long time for us to have writing as a part of our lives for a long time as something that we enjoy and for that to be something that is respected regardless of whether or not we're you know writing a bestseller or you know so um yeah I for me mentorship is about sharing the love of something and saying you know um, have you thought about sending this to this place? That's or right. I know mm. someone who, you know, um, I know a writer who reminds me of um, Emma or Bessie Phillips. I'm like, right, how can I? I know someone who knows this person. I know someone who knows that person. I'm always connecting people. Um, yeah. But also yeah. just to for it to be possible for us to do this as something that we enjoy for whatever for reason what? is important. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, these are lovely answers. Um, I I want to ask a final question. What are you both uh, working on? What's next? <laughs> um, I am working on a kind of collaboration. I'm getting a terrible echo. Wait, can you hear me still? No, no. All right. I'm working on a collaborative book, solo so and dialogue about friendship. Um, crossing mm. a number of decades and having, a, you know, of course, a great deal to do with wow. what we've just what been just talking about, about with cross-racial cross and class, class friendships and, 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 and the and languages, languages that, 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 that sum it up. So, so, you know, you know and, and it'll, be it'll be collaborative, like I said, like but it, it, will, it will, will be, will be, will be solo too, 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 we, we, we write it. So it'll be interesting formally. Wow, wonderful. <laughs> and emotionally. Yeah. And, and, and how, many, how many people, how many collaborators? Just, just, two, just, two, two, just two. I mean, it's yeah. just me, just two just of us. Two of us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very exciting. Victoria, yeah. don't say your dissertation or something. Oh, gosh. I, I should <laughs> be working harder right on that right now. <laughs> um, I can hear feedback as well, actually. You're getting feedback. Yeah. 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 Is it okay, it's okay to continue? Everything okay. sounds great to me. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I should be working more on the thesis. I haven't touched it much recently. Um, but I am working on a novel. I'm about 50,000 words into a novel that I began three or so years ago. Um, the baby. <laughs> Is taking up a lot of time right now, but novel I think is kind of holding space for this thing. Um, he's a cute baby, by the way. It's just, uh, space that I go into for the novel that it, it just feels incredible. It's and it's it's me. Um, I, I've never. I'm I'm new to fiction. I'm not. I I don't. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I just I just want to finish it. I just want to finish it and um yeah see what happens next yeah i have no doubt both of you what exciting projects thank you so much for joining me today this was such a lovely conversation thank you thank, thank you. you it was it was such fun it <laughs> Bye to both of you. Work well. Thank enjoy. You. Enjoy life. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.